Welcome everyone. So just just to let you know uh, about the new procedure for questions. So once Dr. Dugba has concluded concluded her presentation, we'll start the, the the question here from here in Quebec, and then uh, and then uh, we'll go with the other side. Just to remind everyone to keep their microphone on mute. So. I'll present uh, Dr. Mama Joyce Dugba. She's an assistant professor and researcher in the Department of Family and Emergency Medicine at Laval University's Faculty of Medicine. She co-leads the Patient Engagement Group with the Diabetes Action Canada Support Network and co-developed the Patient Engagement Mechanism of the network through consultation with those who live and are touched by diabetes. Her research agenda focuses on evaluation of collaborative practices with patient users in research and the education of health professionals. Dr. Dugba holds a degree in general medicine from Togo and a PhD in public health from University of Montreal. She completed her postdoctoral fellowship at the Shriners Hospital from McGill University. So we're very glad to meet Dr. Joyce Dugba. Thanks, Simon. Uh, so hello, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to start my presentation this uh, afternoon. So the title, as you can see uh, on the slide, is really the message from deliberative dialogue to knowledge translation and effective research tool. So as you can see once again, this is a work that has been supported by researchers from Laval University, Montreal University, and the Quebec Support, Sports Support Unit. So uh, I'll start the presentation by acknowledging the contribution of everyone who helps for, uh, in this work. After I will give a, a short word of context, where does this project come from? I will then present the learning objectives and then uh, present the knowledge translation method and mechanism. We will then define what a deliberative dialogue is. We will learn how to organize and host, host a deliberative dialogue before reflecting on deliberative dialogue as an effective knowledge translation tool. And then we will have some take-home uh, take messages. So first of all, this work could not uh, have been completed without the precious collaboration of people that I uh, listed on the slide. As you can see, we have some researchers from Université Laval, Mathieu Humain. I had a project coordinator. We have research assistants. And we have two researchers from Montreal University. And then we have the uh, invaluable uh, contribution and financial support of the Quebec Sports Support Unit. So just a word of context, where does this work come from? As you can see on the slide, it's two things, two entities that supported this work. The first one being the Quebec Sports Support Unit, who was, int was interested in knowing what researchers and decision makers define as deliberative dialogue, and also whether there is a systematic process for organizing and holding deliberative dialogue. Then we have the RENA research team located in Montreal, who uh, the research team which uh, work on what the research status of knowledge translation in, so in social science is. And then we have a joint question that is question number three that is shared both by the Quebec Sports Support Unit and the RENA team that is to know whether deliberative dialogue are effective way for knowledge translation. So to answer the question of the Quebec Sports Support Unit, we carried out, we carried out a scoping review, so in health uh, service research, and the RENA research team carried on an ongoing information monitor, monitoring uh, system. And today's presentation is at the junction of the two words that I was glad to be part of. 
So as I was saying, we carried out a scoping review. I believe all of you know what scoping review is. In one word, is a, a rapid mapping of the literature and of, on, of the evidence on a team, a research team or a new domain. And but it follows a systematic way of doing it. So starting from what is the research question, what are the relevant studies? So in our case, we went and looked for relevant studies in PubMed, Embase, and Web of Science with the help of a librarian. And we charted the data using some, um, um, some grids that I mentioned on the protocol. So if you want question about that one, I'm glad to answer after. And as I said also, the RENA research team carried down a continuous information monitoring system. So those work together led, the scoping review led to the identification of 82 articles, as you can see on the slide. So we started by 5,631 articles and narrowed it down through a very um, systematic and rigorous process down to 82 articles. And we added two articles. Anyway, I added two articles. That was the first one is a systematic review and the second one is a scoping review on the status of what the research and knowledge translation is in social science. So you have the references and I invite you to consult them if you want more information on that. So now let me come to the learning of the objective of this knowledge translation round. I have three objectives and it will be uh, my pleasure if after this presentation, every participant will be able to identify what the three core characteristics of a deliberative dialogue for knowledge translation is. If we can describe or at least remember what are the fundamental steps uh, when you want to organize or host a deliberative dialogue and also to be equipped to be able to reflect or discuss on deliberative dialogue as an effective method for knowledge translation. So as you can see, those objectives align with the, the first three research questions, the first two that guided the scoping review and the third one that was shared by the scoping review and my participation in the RENA research team. So first of all, we, before uh, talking about deliberative dialogue, I know that most of you uh, are familiar with knowledge translation, so I'm not going to, de uh, to describe it in detail. Neither am I going to um, start talking about all the theories that you are <coughs> familiar with in knowledge translation, but I just want to borrow from the CIHR definition of knowledge translation, which is a dynamic and iterative process with the aim to improve health and strengthen the, uh, the healthcare system. And that is composed of many things. For me, the most important one I want to focus on is the dissemination of knowledge, but also the ethically sound application of knowledge, which is also known as the implementation of knowledge. And one of the things that I cannot overlook is the fact that for this presentation, when I'm talking about deliberative dialogue, I'm more focusing on researchers and knowledge users, even though my expertise is more in working with patients. But this is fundamental for the presentation that I'm doing today. So uh, knowledge translation has a lot of mechanisms that can help to implement knowledge, and I'm not talking about dissemination, I'm talking about implementation of knowledge. And the work we did with the RENA research team helped us based on the two articles that I mentioned to you in the beginning to categorize the mechanism of implementation of knowledge translation in six categories, and I'll come back to that later. But let me draw your attention on one category, that is the interaction because deliberative dialogue is an interactive uh, um, mechanism of knowledge translation. As I'm saying, I will come back to what those categories are and whether they are effective tools for knowledge translation or not. 
So that will lead me to define what a deliberative dialogue for knowledge translation is. And this is a definition that is adapted for Bo from Bo the article of Boyko 2012, saying that uh, knowledge translation, I've added the first sentence, is an interaction mechanism, a deliberative dialogue, sorry, is an interaction mechanism of knowledge translation based on three characteristics, and I, I will just remind you of one of our ob objectives at the end of the presentation is to be able to remember that when you are doing deliberative dialogue, you need to examine research data. You need at the end to make decisions relative to a question that is of high priority, but the examination of research data need to be done according to the perspective and the experiences of people that are invited at the deliberative dialogue. And as I said in the beginning, in my case, is knowledge user, but more specifically, uh, healthcare decision makers. There is a fundamental difference that we need to know when we are talking about deliberative dialogue that differentiate deliberative dialogue from debate. So when you are debating, you are opposing to somebody, okay? You are arguing and you are asserting, and the aim, the objective at the beginning is to have a winner or a loser. When you are doing deliberative dialogue, what you are doing is to collaborate, to discuss, to learn from others, to establish relationships, and fundamental at the beginning, we want to make a decision. We want to reach a consensus. So I think if the, the, one, if the only thing that we got from this presentation is to know this difference is fundamental because as researchers, we need to know that we are discussing with uh, knowledge users not to be winners or losers, but to make consensus and take decisions. So in our scoping review, based on the 82 articles, we found that um, the purpose is for what, uh, the reason for what um, deliberative dialogue are organized, there are a lot of them, but mainly is to identify public health priorities. Sometimes deliberative dialogue are used as a means for research priority setting exercise. This can be discussed, but we found it in the literature, so I'm just reporting on that. Uh, at times, it is used to create or to evaluate a knowledge translation platform, and finally to create or implement a treatment algorithm. So the point is that may, uh, in some cases, there was a question on uh, breast cancer, and the users, knowledge users, decision makers, and researchers need to come together with clinicians to create a treatment algorithm. So the format of the liberative dialogue that we found in our scoping review as this uh, uh, graphic can show, most of them it was uh, in, under the format, in the format of conferences, and sometimes it was think tank or forums, so you can see, I'll draw your attention on the, we have four cases where they say that the format of deliberative dialogue is focus group. So I intentionally put it here because we need to um, be faithful to what we found in the literature. But as researchers, you know that when we are talking about focus group, focus group is a technique for data gathering. But what people mean is that they gathered knowledge users and researchers together to debate on a question of high priority. So I would just recommend that when you are doing deliberative dialogue, you do not use focus group because it is a consecrated term for qualitative data gathering. But because we found it in the literature and it is named like that, I put it on the graphic. So most deliberative dialogue that we examine in our scoping review took place in a research center. Is it a good idea in the take home messages, we will come back to that one. But in some places, it took place in an hotel, which is feasible. It all depends on your objective and the resources you have. And in one case, it is reported that it happened, sorry, uh, at the prime minister's office. 
depends on the access that you have. It's up to you to choose where to do your deliberative dialogue. So who participated in the deliberative dialogue and what was their role? So for deliberative dialogue for knowledge translation, the core participants should be the researchers and the decision makers. But you can have patients, you can have the public, you can have the media. You must have facilitators and recorders. Without those persons, it's difficult to record and to follow up with the decision. And what happens, what was described in the list of Who are you? Uh, can I continue, Megan? Maybe people should mute their mic because we are hearing some feedback. Thank you. Sorry. So, yes, I'm trying. I'm trying to mute people as they come on, but uh, sorry about that. Okay, continue. Okay, thank you. So researchers most of the time prepare and organize the meeting. They produce what is called policy brief and they summarize the decision. Most of the time, private society will be those founding the uh, deliberative dialogue or the implementation of uh, the decision. In our literature, most deliberative dialogue were, were hold with less than 50 participants. In fact, it was around 20 participants. But in six cases, it was reported up to 500 people. Is it an effective way for taking decision? I think you can organize yourself, but recommendation will rather go to 50% maximum. It facilitates decision making process. In summary, what we found in the literature, uh, the scoping review, uh, is that 80 uh, out of 82 deliberative dialogue happened in person. But we have some six that was asynchronous. That means that uh, all the meeting did not happen at the same place, but meeting was uh, uh, happened in different time about the same subject. We also have some times where follow up was made by email and telephone. So we have in person meeting followed up with email and telephone to uh, implement the decision. And as I said, usually we have eight to 10 participants per meeting, okay? So per meeting, because first of all, we need to go back to the literature to see whether, because some people have two meetings, no, but it was eight to 10 participants per meeting. And sometimes they have a meeting of two hours, sometimes they have a meeting of uh, two days, okay? So now I'm uh, taking you to our second learning objective is how to organize and host a deliberative dialogue. I think one thing to remember is, how, is that intuitively you can even think even whatever you organize, you have a before, a during, and an after. Okay, so this also follows that simple or simplistic rule. The only thing is that you need to be careful to what you do before. So we have a long list of activities that you can carry out before, but for me, the core three activities that you must make sure that is well done is first of all to identify who you want to participate in this deliberative dialogue. The second one is, as we say, when people are coming together at the deliberative dialogue, the first condition, we want them to examine research data. So you need this data to be available. So before the deliberative dialogue, if in your research team, you can have some people uh, in charge of a contextualized literature, literature review on what you are going to examine at the meeting. For example, you want to uh, a decision making on uh, the uh, use of, uh, uh, of drug in, um, in Quebec. So you need to know what is the situation. So carry on a quick and rapid literature review, but never go without this knowledge 